Today on the Cameron Journal podcast, I am so happy to be sitting here with Michael Halpert. He is the author of The Ultimate Survival Guide for Your First Job. And um, this is called, is also called, there's also the subtitle. The actual title is Cubicle to Corner Office, which is really cool. Um, and, uh, and this is to kind of help people on their professional journey, getting their first job, internship, all this type of thing. And given the complete disaster that is the job market right now um i'm excited to hear his strategies for navigating it he used to be at google and lots of other fancy tech places um so he's much higher rent than uh, than those of us around here who spent our lives working in the arts um so we're gonna find out how to survive the corporate world so welcome michael to the cameron journal podcast thank you so much for having me I'm, i'm really excited to be here yes well thank you so let's start from the beginning why don't you tell us a little bit about um the jobs you've had in the past and how they inspired you to write this. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, so I actually also worked in the arts. Uh, funny enough, I know you mentioned that. So I started my career in Hollywood. Um, I went to film school at NYU uh, for my undergrad, and I ended up working at the William Morris Agency um, as an agent. Ooh, assistant. fancy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. People hear about that as like, you know, the mailroom job. And, you know, that's basically what it was. I was answering the phone and, um, working with a lot of different clients um, in an area that was called like commercial endorsements, uh, which is sort of interesting. So we worked with like Ryan Seacrest and Usher and all sorts of interesting folks to help them find ways to like expand their business. So it was, uh, that was like the height of the same for uh, what's the show? Um, American Idol. That was when like he was super, super popular. So it was an interesting time. Started there, I worked for some film producers, but then uh, I actually switched, did a little career pivot, uh, and I ended up working for uh, a social network called DeviantArt um, as a product manager, and I was kind of a jack of all trades. I wore many hats. It was a very small startup, and it was the largest online social network um, even before like MySpace and Friendster or any of the sites which you may not even remember, but um, we built some really cool technology and there were millions of artists who were sharing their work on that platform. So that was, uh, that was a lot of fun. I learned a ton there. Um, then one day I realized I kind of hit a ceiling in my own professional progression and I decided to go to business school and I went and got my MBA at uh, USC Marshall, which was fantastic. And that really opened up a ton of doors for me. Um, while I was there, I interned at Google, like you mentioned uh, before. Then I ended up working in consulting at a big agency called Huge um, out of Brooklyn, New York. And we had a number of Fortune 500 clients that ranged from Comcast Cable to Warner Brothers, even international clients and telecom space. I uh, worked with a bunch of banks like Morgan Stanley. So it was, uh, it was really, really interesting. Um, and then from there, I tried to go into the startup realm for a bit. And then I ended up at Walmart e-commerce, like right as it was growing really rapidly as a competitor to Amazon. Uh, this was about uh, six years ago. And then from there, um, I'm now working at a company called Thrasio, uh, which is an Amazon aggregator. Uh, we basically sell a lot of different kinds of household products and things like that on, on Amazon. So everything ranging from pillows to kitchen accessories to flashlights. Um, it's a really interesting business. And my career, took a bunch of different turns along the way. Um, I thought I was going into business development for a while. Um, then I ended up learning more about technology and product management. And that's really what I've been doing for a while. And as I progressed in my career, I started working as like an individual contributor. And over time, I became a you know, manager and then a people leader. And now I manage a team of about 15 people. Um, so I, I Quite impressive. Thank yes, you. quite quite impressive. It's quite a quite a journey. So, what would you say were some of the the key the key things you learned along the way that got you to where you are? I don't think it's any one thing, and that was really the inspiration for the book. I, I don't think it's one set of skills or a set of relationships. I think you have to think of your career kind of as a a portfolio um, in a way. So you have to think about it in the context of the hard skill building. So, you know, what are the things that I'm really good at? Can I build models in Excel? Do I know how to code? Do I know? There's all sorts of different kinds of jobs, right? 
for lawyers, I'm sure that there's, you know, different ways that they learn how to, you know, write legal briefs and depositions. If you're in accounting, you learn all sorts of other different skills. So there's sort of the hard skills that you learn around your job. Then there's the soft skills. Um, and then there are other things like relationships and um, also personal branding and things like that are also very important. So I realized like you have to really think about all of these things. And those these are all topics that I tried to cover in cubicle to corner office. I think when you go into your first job, you're trying to just make sure you're staying above water and and you can just do the tasks that you're assigned. But I think if you understand the broader context of your career progression and how you should be moving forward, I think you start asking different kinds of questions at work. You start having better interactions with your managers. So I try to cover this whole variety of hard skills, soft skills, um, mentorship, relationship, all those kinds of things in the book. Yes, and, and that is, um, I know that there's probably a lot, so I have a lot of 25 to 44 listeners right now. So I'm sure that there's there's a lot of people who are kind of in, I would say the messy middle of the mm -hmm. career path. Um, right. You know, and, and I find myself in this place as well. Um, I did this business for three years. I left it, went back to work, made some money, paid off my credit cards, felt better about my life. And then in 2019, started doing this business again um, and and morphed how I did it and all this sort of thing. Um, and now I kind of find myself at a, at a crossroads of my own where I'm... Um, I'm working with a new book publisher, which is exciting, and we're working on books together. I'm also doing some stuff for them, um, and it is at the very executive level when I'm used to doing everything, so that's been a challenge. I'm trying mm -hmm. to get other people to do things, um, which is difficult, um, and it, I also feel like it's it's difficult to move on to the next the next step or the next stage how does one navigate and get out of the messy middle the messy middle um i think you're asking a really important question um let me think about it for a second the the book is really geared towards taking like the first steps but i think you're, you're bringing up an interesting challenge like once you start you know well let's even let's basics. let's take let's take it back then let's take it back then so mm -hmm. One of it was I, when I first started in this business, I I was on Craig. You're gonna laugh. I was on Craigslist. I had three. So I was a start out in freelance copywriting. I had three services, and I would answer ads. That's how I started this whole journey way back in 2005. Um, and it it was a very difficult thing to make that leap from you know someone who does some things to like director of marketing right. um because there were so many more skills that were required so many more things to track so many reporting things all this type of thing so if you're one of my younger listeners who's maybe in their mid-20s and they're looking at taking on maybe their first team lead role how mm -hmm. does one make that jump from individual contributor to like leading maybe a small team or being nominally responsible for some deliverables <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So no, I think it's a really, really important question. And I struggled with this myself because I think there are parts of it that are your technical skills and your knowledge. Um, and parts of it have to do with your credibility um, in terms of how people perceive you in the workplace and how other people think of you in terms of your deliverables, your communication skills, all those, those kinds of things. Mm. So when you get into team management um, or the way that I always think about this uh, is that you don't get promoted, you promote yourself. So in larger companies, they do a pretty good job. Ooh, say that one more time. Say that one more time. You don't get promoted, you promote yourself. Mm, yes. So at, at larger companies, they do a really good job of defining competencies and skills for each level. So mm. what would like, let's say in product management, you know, what is an associate product manager, uh, associate product manager responsible for? Then what is a you know product manager responsible for? Then the senior product manager, then a group product manager, then a director, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a ladder. And within that ladder, there are hard skills that are expected to be understood. So do you understand your business? Do you work? Do you understand your stakeholders? Do you understand how each of the departments function. Do you understand like the broader operating system of the business? How are you at 
creating deliverables? How are your presentation skills? So if you think about all those different kinds of things that are sort of, you know, a culmination of, of your work, and then there's also the questions of your soft skills, right? So how are you perceived by others? How well do you collaborate? How are your influence skills? Um, how good are you at public speaking? All those kinds of things that that really matter. Um, and then there's always this big question that's a little hairier is, you know, how is your judgment? When things aren't really like cut and dry and there isn't a clear answer, how good are your instincts at making the right decision or aligning the decision with you know the larger values of the company? Um, and I think that when you're trying to get promoted, you have to demonstrate all of those things. So if you understand what is required at the next level, once you start demonstrating that, once you start volunteering for more projects and taking on more responsibility, you're effectively in the next level. You just haven't been given the, the title. And I spend, um, there's a chapter in my book that talks about um, career development. And there's another one that talks about compensation. And both of these things kind of go hand in hand and they talk about different review cycles and, and how those work. Not everybody understands that in their first job. So this is one of the topics that I think is really important to understand. So how do Absolutely. you basically set, how do you set yourself up for success so that when you get into the proper review period, even if there are only a few slots for, you know, promoting people at the company, how do you make sure that your name is at the top of the list? Or no, I mean, I, and I can say like when it comes to, you know, delivering a lot and all that type of thing that can that can pay off in very tangible ways. Mm -hmm. um, when I took my break a couple years ago, I um, I got the biggest raise in the office my first year there. Um, it wasn't a lot. It was only 7%. But I heard from others that, you know, well, they said there was no raises of above 5% available. And I'm kind of like, yeah, I got seven. But I mean, I had also in three months had taken a, a system that they had been purchased from hey, we own the rights to this thing, but have never used it to launching it to the delight of our membership in 90 days. Um, yeah, great. And so, yeah, so it was one of those things of like, you know, if you pull, if, I mean, if it had ended in disaster, it would have been disastrous, <laughs> but because it didn't, and I was able to pull it off, the there are no raises above 5% available rule went straight out the window when I walked in the room. Yeah, I think, you know, so there, I mean, the so when people wonder like, oh, am I taking on extra for no good reason? Maybe, maybe not. Depends on your organization. Yeah, exactly. And what your manager or other senior leadership has at their discretion. Sometimes there's very structured plans for raises and bonuses. And sometimes they have some extra discretionary funds that they can deliver to their top performers. So even if you... It shouldn't things shouldn't be that transactional, right? Like when you take on a new project, like yes, maybe it's extra work, but maybe you're also developing a new skill, right? Maybe you're getting access to new people that you haven't met at the company who can now see how good you are. Mm. Uh, maybe you're getting to meet other senior executives. Maybe there's other perks that you're getting. So it's not just about like taking on extra tasks. There's sort of like tangible and intangible things. And then to your point, if you do a good job, if you're doing right by your customers if you're doing right by other people in the company then it just becomes kind of a natural conversation of just like hey we see that you're over delivering you're doing a great job we want to you know we want to retain our best talent we want to reward our best talent so what can we do that would you know make cameron feel happy about working here so maybe it's a raise maybe it's a promotion maybe it's a new kind of responsibility so all those things are on the table Yes. Well, and that was, uh, and also when he, when he mentioned networking, I think especially early in your career, that's so important. In that job, I actually got recruited away by that company's IT firm because I had come in and I turned around their marketing. They had no marketing when I arrived. And that was a, only part of my job, but we were a small staff. So it was me and one other person who were kind of tag teaming on that. There wasn't a dedicated role for that. And they were kind of like, yeah, we've watched you guys go from nothing to everything. And, it, and they were kind of like, can you come do that for us? And it was, that was how I ended up having to leave that organization because they were not happy about that. Um, <laughs> but um, it, yeah, I mean, sometimes like, that's why I say, grab business cards, shake hands, even with vendors, because mm -hmm. a vendor at company A may be your job 
later you never i mean you literally never know you and know that yeah. no and that came out of they literally cornered they came to do our it stuff they cornered me in the parking lot after work to get a hold of me like they waited to and literally approach me in the parking lot after to, to say we knew we would like to have a conversation with you um and it came out at left field i had no idea that i was I had impressed them. They had seen anything. I had no clue. And then, and it was, you know, it was a really great opportunity. So that's why I tell, especially people early on in the careers, grab every business card, shake every hand, because you don't know, you truly don't know who's watching. You really don't. Yeah. And it's important to really spend some time thinking about like how visible am I in, yes. in this role? And I think networking is really, really important. And I spend a good chunk of the book talking about networking and how to network appropriately and make sure that you're, you know, both providing value and getting value out of relationships. But I think to what you were saying, it's pretty clear that you, you built up credibility, right? Like you built a brand for yourself as somebody who could over deliver and get things done. And people want to be surrounded by other people who can you know, get things done. It's important. And that. Yes. No, I mean, I mean, and that is that is very that is very very true, and that's why I say you don't know who is watching, and also sometimes you know your lead on this project they have their own career path, and it's, mm-hmm. this is especially true in media and the arts. When people move up, they take the people they know with them. Yeah, um, and this is this has been true for me. Um, I've made a lot of in my present organization i made a a very big connection for my client i actually saved another project of his so i'm the favorite right now i just i I just bailed him out 30 grand so i'm i'm he really likes me right now um (laughs) but that's something where it's like but i when the thing is and i tell i tell people this i said i said you you don't know who i might else i might meet that i can connect you with you know, sort of thing. And that's where, like, in especially in media, and this was true in theater, this was true in fashion, all this type of thing. As people move up, they take those they know with them. So a new opportunity for someone else in your network, if you play your cards right, can sometimes be a new thing for you, too. Yeah, absolutely. Depends on I, how you work it. Yeah, I, I saw this a lot in entertainment um, early on. So I thought... That was oh, an yeah. interesting industry because people move around jobs all the time and they bounce between agencies and production companies and studios and things like that. Um, so there's actually a pretty strong culture of even assistants and other people just getting drinks with other people, just getting to know other people, building those relationships because you never know when you might want to work some, with somebody or you know call them later on. I guess I'm probably... Eh, say like a third of the way through my career and I can't even count how many people I've worked with multiple times or people I've brought to you know the current company that I'm at or people who have helped me out in the past or even sometimes when I'm just in a jam right like I don't know my company has never done you know this thing in social media marketing but my friend has done it for their company so I'll just give them a ring and like hey can you give me some pointers on you know how to accomplish this we're not competitors so it's not like he's giving me you know any trade secrets yeah. or anything like that and then people if you have good relationships, they're more than willing to help you. It's really, really no, important. and and sometimes sometimes it can be really great to reach backwards. I did this when I I had moved on to an HVAC company, and I um, had come out of rental housing and property management. And I said, you know what? Let's build that business. We don't do enough of that in rental housing and whatnot. Let's go build that business. And I said, I know just how to do it. So what I did is I called my old organization. I bought fifty thousand dollars of advertising, and in six months we had a business doing HVAC for rental properties, and it was very profitable. So. Uh, everybody was happy. My old organization was happy because they got 50 grand out of me because I had budgetary powers in my new role. And then the new business, they had a, they had never explored opening that business. And I said, oh yeah. I said, and it's great because these people are, you know, oftentimes live out of state. They're absentee landlords. They just want to call a number and have someone go fix the problem. And we can charge them a lot of money for it. <laughs> and, and it ended up being a great, it ended up being a great business. But that's something where it's like no harm, no foul. If I can still find a use for you, I may you may not be my favorite person, but if we can do business, let's do business. I don't care. You know, that's how the kind of the game is played, I feel. Yep, 100 percent Absolutely. So now here's another now here's a trend among young people that I think is interesting per your book. Job hopping. Now, mm-hmm. I am an ancient millennial. I am 35 years old. 
I am turning to dust before our very eyes. So I think I might I might even have you beat. I'm I'm 41 and I'm still technically a millennial. Yes, yeah, because 80, yes, 80 to 95. Um, yeah. so uh yeah, so uh, when we were growing up, job hopping was bad. And that my dad has worked for the same company for 29 years this year. Job hopping was the most terrible, terrible sin. And I got a lot of criti- criticism early in my career because I worked at the state senate and then I worked here. I was I was all over the place. And people were like, Oh my god, you need to settle down. Well, now the young kids if they stay two years, that's considered an eternity. Even mid-career professionals to get a pay bump are leaving every two, every three years. What is your thoughts on job hopping? Is it is it good? Is it bad? Is it a great way to get more money? What's what's your thoughts? So I think there's a really great book by Reed Hoffman. Um, so uh, he's a venture capital investor and he uh, started LinkedIn actually, yes. um, and uh, he talks a lot about this framework um, in the context of work. Uh, and he called it tours of duty, which is very very similar to how the military thinks about it. And I think that's probably the best way to think mm-hmm. about your career. Um, so, as you think about a job, um, when you walk into it, you should try to be explicit and talk with your manager, your leader about what you're getting out of the job besides the paycheck, right? So there's skills that you're going to be developing. There's experiences that you're going to be having. There's relationships that you're going to be building, um, whether it's within the company or clients and things like that. Um, And maybe your tour, you know, as you think of it in terms of accomplishing the goal, maybe you're signing up for a project or a new product release or something like that. Maybe the natural evolution of a tour is two to three years. And then you try to figure out the next thing. So it kind of depends if you're working at smaller companies or bigger companies. Um, at a bigger company, it, even if you stay within the company every two or three years, you're probably going to be assigned to a new project or some kind of new task anyway. So even though you're not necessarily, you know, quote unquote, job hopping, you're still switching roles. So I think mm-hmm. naturally at this point when you're pretty early in your career and you're like rapidly picking up new skills and you're learning new things and then applying um, different tools to your job. I think it it is more likely. The only thing that I will say that is an advantage to sticking around at a company for a long time, uh, particularly if you work at a public company, um, it takes a while for you to get uh, stock grants. So a lot of public companies give you um, restricted documents or options or things like that. Um, so if you're job, jumping around between jobs every year, every two years, you're never going to accumulate that value um, in stock, uh, which I think is kind of tricky. And sometimes you don't think about it, um, but that's actually, once you start getting to like the middle and later points in your career, uh, that's probably where you might end up getting the most compensation. Um, so like, I'll give you uh, an example. When I was at Google, there mm-hmm. were tons of people uh that i knew there who had been at the company for 10 years and still work there today they've been there forever um so think about that if you look at google's stock chart you know compared to where you know where it was 20 years ago to where it is today they're doing very well all, yeah mm-hmm. they're all multimillionaires, but they're not any different than the people you would meet working at any other company in the same kind of role they just happened to have, you know, invested in the company and the company did well and rewarded them. And because of their loyalty, you know, they, they don't have to work. They just do it because, you know, they enjoy being productive. So it's, um, it's kind of crazy to think about those kinds of things. I think it's, it's easier to do at a very big company, but, um, but yeah, you should always be moving around to acquire new skills, new experience. Yeah. Well, and that's, and that's not even limited to the tech sector. I grew up in Northwest yeah. Arkansas, Um, And one of the big things Walmart does, they do it for retail level as well, but particularly Mm -hmm. at the corporate office in Bentonville, um, is the is the stock share with employees and people co- yep. will come out of walmart 20 25 years with a boatload of walmart so, so and sometimes especially if depending on when you started some of those so they got in some of those shares that you know a dollar they are from the 80s and 90s they got it for a dollar two dollars yeah. so even at 35 dollars they've done well um you know so um yeah i mean yeah. that is well, when, no that is when I something to consider walmart, when i started at walmart um i think the shares 
that were granted to me were around 70 or 75 dollars yes um and today they're trading at like 160 165 you've done very yeah. well <laughs> so think about it like you know yeah it, it, i think walmart's a great company and i think it's very stable so i've chosen to hold on to that stock and you know it's part of my retirement nest egg right but the way i look at it is like you know there's whatever there was the value of the shares that they gave me at the time that uh, i was working there and there were times those have grown so it's, it's almost like uh, i got a double bonus it was great so i think those yeah. are the things that you get when you stick around at a company for a long time yeah no that is that is certainly that is certainly true so now what made you want to go into the startup realm and what made you go back sure i think because I think I think a lot of readers will face that choice at some point, you know, and so we should chat about it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think this is a great question. Um, for myself, I think what I was trying to do was branch out and pick up new experience. To be honest, um, even though I had been managing people and you know I had a good title and I worked for a big company, uh, I wasn't doing quite as many things on the consumer side at Walmart. So there was a whole separate team run in a different department that was managing walmart.com the website the apps things like that and mm -hmm. i was working a little bit more on the operational side of merchandising which was what's everything that goes on the site right like what products do we carry how do we price them how do we think about customer demand for these kinds of products how do we think about uh, our customer return policies like all those kinds of things that sort of are core to the operations of uh, walmart e-commerce um, mm -hmm. but i wanted to do some things that were consumer facing and when i got an opportunity to do that um, I realized I could take what I had already learned and, and built up in my uh, toolbox, and then I could also pick up new skills. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to uh, go to a startup. Also, it's, it's fun to take risk once in a while. There, there are probably a few times in your life where you can take some risk, and with with risk, you sometimes get outsized rewards. So that is one of the things to consider. So if if you do like startups, if you do like working at smaller companies, you can definitely make a larger outside impact uh, you're going to get a lot more responsibility you're going to get purview into a lot more things which i think is a lot of fun i enjoy doing it um but uh, i would not job hop from startup to startup to startup to startup uh, because there's a good chance that um not all of them are going to succeed not all of them will you know get sold or go public and things like that so that's why i was mentioning the stock like I'm lucky in that I worked for stable companies for a while, so I can sort of balance it out, right? So right. still saving for my retirement, I'm still saving for my kids' college, but at the same time, I could take on a little bit of additional risk. But who knows where my next job may be? Maybe it'll be back in another public company. I have no idea. Yeah, no, it is. It is a difficult. Is it is a difficult, a difficult sort of thing. Now, now here's something interesting that I always ran into, and I didn't understand this world because I came from a completely different world of employment with all these new jobs these days they have all these weird tests and mind games and quizzes and all this type of thing care to share how one gets past all of that because i'm so that didn't exist when i was young and starting out in the world and now it seems like it's everywhere and i remember being salty because i'd gotten to a third interview with this tech company and i failed one of their quizzes and i went to google what it was about and apparently you're supposed to study for three months and there was a whole community and i'm just kind of like screw it no no, no thank you like so glad i didn't get the job like just let's move on um how does one navigate all that as a young person starting out yeah i know exactly what you're talking about when you look at some of the bigger tech companies they have really really prescribed hiring processes uh with really really structured interviews and unfortunately uh we've gotten to a place now where there's a little cottage industry of people who help people prepare for those interviews so there's i forgot the names of the sites but there's a bunch of sites that you could look at that would say like it is a whole industry you're not it's lying a whole industry yeah. yes so if you're doing engineering interviews uh if you're in software development um there's questions they're going to ask you that are more like behavioral questions, but then they're also going to look at something called um, leak code, uh, which is, uh, it is a little bit meritocratic, which is good. But basically you go in and it, it assesses your coding capabilities and it says like, you know, you'd be good at this level, this level, or this level. Um, 
which is interesting. Um, in some other roles like design or product management, there's other structured sort of case interviews that they run. Consulting also has these case interviews uh, if you go into strategy or management consulting. Um, I think some of the other tests that I've seen is a lot of employers are starting to take, to ask people to take personality tests. Yes. Which is super interesting. So like Meyer, like a Myers-Briggs style test to understand like, how do you work with others? How are you energized? Do you, you know, are you an introvert or an extrovert? Uh, yes. All those kinds of things I think is, is super interesting. I don't know. I can't tell if it's like too personal or, or maybe it is useful in, in trying to, you know, create well-balanced teams. Um, I mean, a lot of this stuff, I, I know why they're doing it mm -hmm. and I, and I get it, but as, as a neurodivergent person, I feel like it's just a fast way to get rid of neurodivergent people. Like, in terms of like, I know how we'll get rid of all the ADHDers and all the autistics as fast as humanly possible. Um, we'll put in these sorts of personality quizzes and we'll dump them all overboard right from the beginning. I, I feel like it's a nice idea, but I feel like, it, you know, if you kind of fit the mold already, then you'll be fine. But if you don't, then you won't. And it's a really easy way to get rid of people. That's just yeah. my opinion. I don't know if that's if there's any basis in fact on that but that yeah i'm, yeah. I'm not sure i don't i don't work in hr or recruiting i i've been a hiring manager a lot that's not something i thought about i have only put together tests that help gauge competency like i said like this is what we expect of the role we expect presentation skills we expect research we expect people to be able to create something like a product spec so mm. i assess people on those kinds of things uh particularly for people who are you know, midway through their career, um, it's important to see their work product as opposed to like just understanding, uh, hey, can you answer this question on the fly in an interview at the moment? But but I think you bring up an interesting question. Um, is it appropriate and is it a screening mechanism? And where I might push back and on what you were saying is I think there are certain kinds of jobs that tend to actually be good for people who are neurodivergent. So, mm. um, I would say a lot of the software engineers that I've worked with in my career, um, particularly some of the really brilliant ones, probably fall somewhere on the spectrum. So that now that now to your point, IT and CS are kind of a little haven. Yeah. For yes, I mean, and, and that's well known in the community. Like, if you can get a job in that world, chances are your supervisor and his boss will also be spectrumy, and you'll be fine, and your mm -hmm. quirks will not be so weird because everyone's a little, you know, not quite on center down there. And so, yes, um, no, that is, I, I, I agree with you. That is definitely, that is definitely and, true. And I think that people who tend to have ADHD or ADD, like I, I myself uh, have some ADD issues uh, as well. Um, I try to create mechanisms to, to deal with it and process it to make sure that I stay on track. But um, I don't know, I find that a lot of people in sales and marketing uh, sometimes have that kind of personality as well. So I think that there's just different kinds of roles that tend to attract different kinds of people. So it's, it's not, I think you have to find not only what you want to do, but you have to find what you're going to be good at. And I think that that's one of the most important things that you have to do in your career as well. So you have to learn about, you know, what are the things that I like? What are the things that I don't like? And I think that the first couple of years of your career, are really just all about that, right? Like it's, yes, you have to pay for your rent. Yes, you have to pay utilities and you know afford your lifestyle. But the first few years of your career are really about figuring all that out and testing things out. And I talk about that quite a bit uh, in the first couple of chapters of my book, which is like, you know, what really are the goals of your first or second job? Um, and I think it's really about figuring out where you kind of gravitate towards. Yes, no, I, I didn't, I didn't discover uh media I discovered writing I discovered marketing later because my clients demanded it I had not really thought about going into marketing mm -hmm. um and I didn't discover I then kind of used that as an outgrowth to flex into media because I started out in politics and I decided I didn't really like running campaigns or doing campaign events or all I I I wasn't very good at it I'd had several candidates not get anywhere several times in a row and some someone came to me and said 
you're becoming known as the person to hire when you're going to lose. You need to get hitched to a winner and go win something, go win somebody a race. And I said, ah, screw it. So um, I I started working in, in media and I had dabbled in media. I'd been on the radio a few times in my capacity of doing campaigns and all this type of thing. And so I'm like, what if I do more of that? And that ultimately was how the Cameron Journal was created because that got me into media and magazines and publications and then and then the Cameron Journal. Um, you know, if you'd asked me way back then, I would have been like, oh no, I'd like to write for some magazines and, you know, submit some stuff. I, you know, had never planned on ever running one. I've run three, um, not counting the Cameron Journal. Um, you know, and in terms of building my own platform, I would have never thought to do that on my own sort of thing. Um, and part of that was tools. We didn't have the tools that we have now back then. But even as a potential idea, I would, you know, had never kind of thought about that. So, uh, yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah. yeah the, but it was those early, it, it was those, I ran my first magazine when I was 21 years old in 2011. I had a modest team of 11 people, um, including my mom very briefly, and and three publishers and, and a modest budget. Um and and we went from there on that basis. So yeah, it's it is about going out, trying different things, and you might discover something along the way that really tickles your fancy, and then you can become great at it. Yeah, and I think that's really what's most exciting about being alive and and working these days compared to even when I started my career, things were so different back then. They were gatekeepers. Oh yes, uh, I think all of that's gone. Right. If you are interested in making videos, there's nothing stopping you from, you you know, going on YouTube. There's nothing stopping you from creating a podcast. If you like interviewing people, if you want to write, write, put it on Medium, put it on, um, you know, start an email newsletter, put up a, a blog. Like if you have things you want to get out there, the world will tell you whether or not it's uh, it's valuable. Once you start building an audience, like things just sort of grow from there. So I think it's exciting because it's easy to learn. I think a lot of things have been democratized and the gatekeepers aren't really gatekeepers anymore. They're just marketing mechanisms, right? If you look at like a movie studio um, or a book publisher, you were talking about publishing books earlier. Oh, yes. Um, what they do primarily is they help um, their financing entity mm -hmm. and they're a marketer. That's it, right? Yes. Like a movie studio. If, if, Yes, they make the movies, but at the end of the day, if you look at like Disney or Fox, they're a bank and a marketer. Yeah. No, and that that and and that is never has that been more true of the book publishing industry than it is right now. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. and and that is um, you know, it's it's a very different culture than it was 50, 60 years ago when, you know, <laughs> three three to five men at the big five decided what america did or did not read yep. um you know i mean that i mean it was the the number of people who made decisions like that was vanishingly small um so in nowadays you know there's there's people who have whole careers and whole audiences and write stuff and all this type of thing that people at penguin random house have never heard of <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's and and that something. was unthinkable even 40 years ago so it is something like it's 70 of books these days are self-published yes just find interesting niches they find their own audience they build a community and they're able to there's, there's tens of thousands of writers who make a living by just connecting with an audience and doing something providing value yes absolutely and there's there's all sorts of new opportunities there but all right well we're at time, so this is the part of the show when we find out where we can connect with you online where, and where we can buy your book. So why don't you tell us about all that? Sure. So uh, Cubicle to Corner Office, The Ultimate Survival Guide to Your First Job, is available on Amazon, on Barnes & Noble, and all other uh, major booksellers. You can also check out my website, First Job Out of College, where I post a lot of uh, blog posts about different tips and skills and things like that for how to succeed in your career and you can find me on most social media platforms at cubicle to corner so that's uh, instagram and tiktok and elsewhere excellent awesome thank you so much for coming on the cameron journal podcast thank you so much for having me i really had a lot of fun being here
That's all for this episode of the Cameron Journal podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Visit us online at CameronJournal.com. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I love to talk to my followers and listeners. So please feel free to uh, get us on social media at Cameron Cowan on Twitter. And we'll see you next time on the Cameron Journal podcast. Thank you.